This is Storybeat, storytellers on storytelling. Storybeat explores how artists and creators of all kinds craft their stories. So join us as we reveal how master storytellers develop and build brilliant stories that people the world over love and adore. Thanks for joining us on Storybeat. I'm Steve Cuden, coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today is one of the very best writers I know, my good friend, the Emmy award-winning screenwriter, novelist, and producer, Brooks Wachtel. Brooks recently published his first novel, a thrill ride of a story called Lady Sherlock, Circle of the Smiling Dead. Of course, Brooks is no stranger to crafting compelling stories. He's best known, perhaps, for having written more than 100 produced episodes of television fiction, with shows as diverse as Fox's live-action Young Hercules that starred Ryan Gosling, and animated hits like Spider-Man, X-Men, Heavy Gear, RoboCop, Beast Machines, Transformers, and PBS's Liberty's Kids. For younger viewers, he's penned episodes of the preschool hits Clifford the Big Red Dog and Rainbow Fish. His episode, I Did It My Way, for Tuttenstein, won him his Emmy. For the History Channel, Brooks co-created and co-wrote and executive produced many episodes of the hit series Dog Fights. He also wrote and produced other documentaries for that network, including episodes of Defending America, National Guard, The Coast Guard, and additionally he wrote The Great Ships, Search and Rescue, the Royal Navy, and Fly Past, which won the Cine Golden Eagle Award. Most recently, he co-wrote and co-produced Silver Tsunami, an award-winning independent theatrical documentary. When not writing, Brooks serves on the steering committee of the Animation Writers Caucus of the Writers Guild of America West, as well as teaching screenwriting at the UCLA Extension, and perhaps what I find most fascinating and most impressive of all, he's a performing magician member of Hollywood's legendary Magic Castle. Brooks, thanks so very much for joining me today on Storybeat. Welcome. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I um, hadn't realized I'd done all that stuff, and now I have to live up to it. Well, well, you know, you're just showing your age by how much you've done. What was that, young whippersnapper? <laughs> So I, I'm wondering, you've um, you've written all sorts of different things. Do you have a particular preference for writing animation or novels or documentaries? Is there something that if I said to you you were going to have to do it for the rest of your life, you could do nothing else, is there one you would prefer over the other? Oh, my God, what a question. Also, let me preface this by saying a few weeks ago I had one hell of a cold and a little bit of the cough is still with me. So if you find me <laughs> like that coughing through the interview... Please bear with me. Oh, you're just being all choked up about being here, I know. That, too. <laughs> um, to answer your question, no, there is no one favorite. One of the things I love about writing is that you get to work, you know, you get to play in so many sandboxes, and they each have their own charms. I mean, uh, animation was fun because it's so unlimited. Live action is fun because it's, frankly, a lot less work than animation. Um, and uh, And it's all just telling great stories. Documentaries are fun. It's a different skill set because the plot already exists and you have to find a way to structure it into drama. Um, novels, that was an entirely new thing I had to learn no and doubt. it was so much fun. Um, you know, it, it's a much bigger canvas than screenwriting, but many of the skills that you learn as a screenwriter are directly applicable to novels. In what way? Can you tell us how they apply? Certainly. Uh, structure, because even a novel, a good one, is basically three acts, beginning, middle, and end. So that basic structure of, you know, act one, set up the problem, act two, complicate the problem, act three, resolve it, still works. The ability to you, to craft succinct and smart dialogue, I found worked very well in a novel. My novel doesn't have a character, say, going on for paragraphs, as you find in some novels. The dialogue is much more cinematic and reads and flows, I think, very well. Skills you pick up as a screenwriter, the ability to visualize scenes and create dramatic scenes where the scenes themselves have their own arc, and the ability to blend scenes together for a flow, 
All of those things, I think, are directly applicable from screenwriting to novel there for any kind of writing. Well, I can certainly vouch for uh, having had having uh, read uh, Lady Sherlock yes. myself. I can vouch for the fact that the the story is full of action and life, and the dialogue does not drag on and on like it does in some novels. And so, I think that you really did a great job. Uh, presenting us with a clear vision and story and great characters in a what I would call a crackling yarn. Thank you very much. And folks, available at Amazon.com. <laughs> okay, so what would you say are the major differences then, if any, in approaching cartoons versus novels and documentaries? What differences are there? Well, let, let's go to um, uh, backtrack a little to screenplays versus novels, and then we'll break down the various types of screenplays. How would that be? That works for me. Go for it. The first, the first difference is when you're doing a novel, one of the first things you have to decide is whose voice the novel is being told in. Uh, is it a first person? Is it second person? Is it third voice of God, third person? That is not something you need to worry about in a screenplay. I mean, the screenplay has a point of view, but a screenplay is always written in the present as if you're watching a movie online. It's, it, it, there's, that's a significant difference in the way you approach writing technique. Uh, yes, because you have to find the voice of the novel. In the case of Lady Sherlock, it's a reminiscence, bookended by a you know a third person, third person uh, chapters. But so that's that's screenplay. the that's your framing device, Brooks. Yes, you've got a it's it's a it's basically one huge flashback. Yes, one huge flashback, which in a novel allows you to comment on the action, comment on the eras that have passed, because the flashback the framing story is 1982 and the flashback uh, the main bulk of the novel is 1906 so you get you get a perspective from the person telling the story where you don't have that so much in a film i mean in a film you could use a few voiceovers but it, it is it's not the same a film when you're writing a film script it the impact is it, you're writing in the present so the the reader the reader has to read that read that script and see the film because the big one big difference is that a screenplay no matter how well written is simply a blueprint for another medium that's it's for a sure tool that a lot of people are going to work on it's an architect's plan for someone else to it, put together yes it's an architect's plan and and of course you can't build a great structure without a great plan Definitely. so you know if it's not on the page it's not on the stage but a novel is a finished work all on its own well, you have it to be is. able to tap into the reader's imagination, unlike the a screenplay in which you're still tapping into the reader's imagination, but there's, there are lots of blank spaces that are not to be filled in until you get some of the other artists, like the director of photography and the costumer and so on. But, the, but in a novel, you sort of have to be all of those people all at one time as the writer. Yes. Yeah. Interestingly enough, if you ever go back and read Golden Age Hollywood scripts, um, you know, Casablanca, the Informer. I mean, some of those, some of those scripts are amazingly detailed in terms of action, art direction, character movements. Um, sometimes even even giving the um, camera directions. Um, it, it's only recently that screen screenwriters have been discouraged from really putting down their complete vision because you don't want to step on the director's toes. But golden age, golden age writer, screenwriters didn't have that. Can I give a quick aside here? Absolutely. I went to a screening. Um, I went to a, a tribute to Ernest Lehman years ago at the Writers Guild. <clears throat> and Ernest Lehman was a wonderful screenwriter. Tell, tell us what he wrote that, for those who don't know. Um, the Sound of Music, North by Northwest. Uh, also, um, I think he did the book for West Side Story. Many, many films. You can look them up on the IMDb. And they oh, they started with the clip of The Sound of Music, the opening, the famous opening, you know, the Swiss Alps and all of that. Mm -hmm. The hills are alive. The Austrian Alps. And, and, and I'm, I'm sitting there wondering, why are they honoring a screenwriter with this opening of The Sound of Music? Because this is Robert Wise, the director's work. Well, the clip ended. I mean, it, it ended with, you know, the... The hills are alive with the sound of music. Lights went up, and Robert Wise walked out. And echoing our thoughts, said, "You're probably wondering why we opened with that clip." And he said, "I want you to know that everything you saw on the screen, every shot, every location, was an Ernie Lehman script. All I did was film what he wrote." 
that's awesome. That's uh, I did not do, did not realize that, and I think that that's a great testament to how great a writer he was, and even a greater testament to how confident uh, Robert Wise was that he could shoot it that way and not feel like he had to impose himself on it. And I think a a uh, comment on the difference between golden age screenwriting and today. Oh, today, for sure. I, Today, uh, today that would be thrown out. The writer would get in trouble for being that detailed. I personally think that's a mistake because we are the first person to see a movie, and we see it on the back of our eyelids. I and like to we... I like to see it on my on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, we see the, I think we see the words on the computer, but we see the film on the back of our. That eyelids. is absolutely true. The to be able to envision what you're seeing and then become a kind of a reporter as a writer. You're you're envisioning what's you know what you think should be there, and then the way I look at it is is it's almost like you're a reporter, and as a reporter, you're reporting what you're seeing, only it's in your mind's eye before it ever gets out onto some form of uh, written document. I think that's a wonder, wonderful way to say it, and I think I'm going to swipe it for my class. Please do. Please do. Um, so, so I will give you credit, I will give you credit because... <laughs> Credits are a big thing to writers. They are, although you're welcome to steal it, and I'll never know, so that's okay. Um, so well. you, you've uh, you've worked on a very wide range of shows with different styles and tones. Um, you've obviously you've written hardcore action shows, and you've written shows for very young audiences with very gentle sensibilities. What do you do in your mind's eye to adjust your thinking when the styles and the tone of the stories are so different? Do you have to do something with your thinking to adjust? You know, I never intellectualized it. I, I think you just, you know, as, as a professional, you know the arena you're working in, and you uh, you adjust for that arena. I mean, I know if I'm doing Clifford the Big Red Dog, there's not going to be a laser attack that blows up half the town. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, you know, that brings to mind, and, and, and maybe getting back to your other question about the differences in the mediums, Yes. If, if you want to do more on, on that a little. Sure, go for it. Uh, and then we, we can segue back to this because, you know, you, you kind of got me thinking. The, um, so th that's the difference between a screenplay and a novel. And by screenplay, I'm talking about you know, anything for a television, film, any kind of fiction writing. One difference, though, is animation, which, you know, I, I know you know that arena very well. Yes. <clears throat> and in animation, especially when we started in it, uh, you did write like Golden Age Hollywood. You almost overwrote and gave all kinds of details, which is why, you know, a 22-minute episode would have a 36-page script. Yes, that's true. And so that was one where you were encouraged because you had to inspire the layout men and the storyboard artists. In fact, when we first got into it, we, we were putting in ca you know so many camera angles that I used to think, this is crazy. I mean, if a good storyboard artist can't look at a master scene script and figure out how to board it, he needs vocational guidance. Well, when I, when I was at Disney uh, 400 years ago, um, those half-hour scripts were between 42 and 45 pages long. That, that's a little on the even longer side than I was used to, but I remember, yes, I did a uh, Gargoyles, and it was a very long script. Very but, long. Yeah. So um, when when you get to live action writing, like say Young Hercules, yes, it was like being on vacation. You know, you you didn't have to choreograph every single punch of a fight scene. No, you would have been frowned upon to have all that choreography in the script. Yeah, you just did the key points. But um, you know, we also did adaptations of comic books and had to adjust, you know, some of those stories from one medium to another. Cause sure. In a comic book. You can have a thought balloon of 50 words while throwing a punch, and clearly that wouldn't play in live action where the punch lasts a second. Right. So, it, it, so the the big differences are just in understanding the tone and genre of the uh, various different um, styles that you're working in, uh, it, yeah, and and the limitations and what's expected. Preschool is is extremely difficult. Yes, it's, it's it much, looks simple. It's much harder to do than most people think. But, I mean, it looks so simple, and getting that simplicity and making it effective is really hard. And the amount of the amount of scrutiny the scripts get, you know, it's not only the usual broadcast standards and practices, but the child psychologists and all the experts that the company that the companies hire 
and <clears throat> they have to be simpler and more lineal, but you can't ever talk down to the kids because even a preschool kid is going to know when he's being, he or she is being talked down to, and they have great BS detectors, and they will tune you out in a second. Oh, no they... kidding. I've, 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 I've always told my students and anyone who's ever asked that, you know, do you have to write you know, down to students or to young people? And the answer is no, you write for you. You just avoid um, going into subject areas that are way over their heads. So you would never do a, a story on Clifford the Big Red Dog about high finance. That would just not never work. Um, right, or, or yeah, um, I mean, da dad and, and earning enough money for the family budget, yeah, that's not a story that would, that would work. No. Ex exactly. Though I remember pitching a... a uh, Valentine's story where, you know, one kid doesn't get a card and it was turned down because it had an element of sadness. So there's really weird constraints. I wrote most of those with um, Cynthia Harrison. And one of the great things was she had a little girl at the time. So little Katie, you know, who was, you know, three, four, was a great inspiration for some of the stories. I'm sure because uh, you got to see or she got to see um, in action things that would inspire her to, to tell stories that someone of that age would like, that's for sure. <clears throat> yeah, and Katie came home one day and said something to her mom, and she called me and said, listen to what Katie said, there's a story in there, and there, there was. <laughs> you know, it, it's, did, uh, did you get credit? That, that was <laughs> Katie didn't get credit on Clifford, but she did get credit for dog fights, on Is dog fights. Really? How so? Well, <clears throat> dog five, uh, I guess I should explain documentaries, because I did a lot of documentaries. And by the way, well, I'm sure we'll be getting into this, but screenwriting and uh, the kind of careers we have, very much a who-you-know relationship business. No question. No question. And maybe we can get into that later if you want to. But I got into documentaries because of our mutual friend, Rich Mueller. Oh, yeah, sure. He was, uh, which would make a great interview, by the way. He, um, and so would Cynthia. He, he was working on the great ships and knew I loved that subject and knew a lot and said you should go talk to them and he set up an interview and you know they asked me to write it. I, I normally never write sample stuff or, or write test because but I had nothing for documentaries. They asked me to write you know three pages so I did it and they liked it and they hired me <coughs> and uh, I'm trying to remember oh for, uh, for dogfight so we got I got into documentaries and I asked Cynthia on later on if she'd like to get in there too. Uh, what they they had a script they wanted. Cynthia had been helping me just in the background, and and she was very good. And there was suddenly a episode they wanted to do that was a clip show. So we got the transcripts of the do, of the interviews, and you know it was about four feet tall, like a, like several phone books. So you had to really do a lot of reading to understand. Yeah. So uh, you know, Cynthia joined me on that one, and, and you know, it was a great a great team. Well, the Dogfights is a show about air combat, and the idea was that we would interview the aviators and pilots and then bring the combat to life using CGI, which was very revolutionary at the time. There had never been a show with that much CGI. And the reason it came about was that little Katie was at the Sam Goldwyn preschool, and she had a, a boyfriend. And as the two kids would play, Cynthia would be talking to the, the other little boy's dad, who was a CGI animator. Wow. You know, what do you do? What do you do? And and he said, well, I always wanted to do a documentary about air combat. So they called me, and we confabbed and came up with a way to present it. And and we did a you know, we took it to a company, and, and it went as a show. That's a highly simplified version. So because it came about thanks to Katie, on every episode she got a thank you. In the thank yous, her name was listed. Well, that's nice, you know. And it, so much of a career is based on serendipitous <laughs> moments like that, where you can't control it; it just comes to you somehow. Uh, it's not like you can go out and, and decide, "Oh, I'm going to go meet an animator today." It just happened. No, that is absolutely true. The one thing you can control is being ready when that's, the opportunity happens. That's, I think, uh, you know, who was it? I think mean, Thomas Jefferson said something like, uh, luck is, is, is being prepared or something like that. There's a famous quote about being prepared, and that's how you make your break, is by being in the right place at the right time and then being ready for it. Right, because if you don't have the skill set and you don't know what you're doing, it won't help. Well, that, that is for sure. So I, I'm curious, when you're looking at, when you're 
thinking about stories for dog fights or you're thinking about stories for animation or thinking about your next novel whatever stories you're thinking about what for you I, we've, we've hit on a little bit of it but i'm curious what for you um, makes a good story good what what do you look for what do you focus on what's at stake for the main character conflict you know i mean it's, it's a whole stew of ingredients yes to make something work. Well, but beyond, <clears throat> beyond those elements that w you know we we preach and must do in order to to succeed with conflict and so on, is there is there anything is there anything about particular stories that attract you in a way where you go, wow, that's that's what I think of as a good story. That's what I really want to get into. Is it just conflict? Is it just character? I think I think it's the, it's the, the combination and the way it coalesces. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there, what, what was it? There's, there's only two ways that a great story starts. I mean, that you come upon a great story. Either you have a, a great situation or a great character. I think that's quite wise. Um, um, I mean, as an ex example, um, I'm pretty sure Arthur Conan Doyle figured out Sherlock Holmes before he knew what mystery Holmes was going to solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I think, you know... Um, uh, Margaret Mitchell probably envisioned Scarlett O'Hara before she knew what the mechanics of the plot were going to be. Well, th yeah, it's pretty hard to um, just have a plot, a whole plot, and not know what the characters are, because in theory the characters should be driving all of that, so it's nice to know who well, the characters are. True, but on the other hand, I have a feeling H.G. Wells figured out the concept of the time machine and the future the time traveler was going to visit before he ever figured out who's the guy I'm going to put in the saddle of the time machine. That may be true, but he or, cer he certainly had the, the character all figured out prior to writing the novel, that's for sure. Well, I, I guess because the, char the character is almost a cipher. You know, he's never even given a name. He's just called the Time Traveler. Yes. And and in the War of the Worlds, again, I, I, I think, you know, H.G. Wells figured out the Martians and the, the mechanics of the plot and, and the what he was trying to say with the invasion. That's what he was trying to say with the future the time traveler visits before he just the nameless narrator say of the war of the world reports what's going on um so th those are the two ways you you know you come upon the story and then you work out one or the other i i, I think that that's that's probably dead on the money for everything i've ever written and certainly probably everything you've ever written is you've got to figure out one of those two things first it it almost sometimes it comes with a, just a spark of inspiration there's something that happens and so that yeah. circumstance is all that it takes and off to the races you start to figure out ways to put characters into that circumstance but well as, as a lot of our career has been in television we don't have to worry about the characters because we're working on shows where they're established. Unless you're creating the characters, unless you're someone who has created a show from scratch. Well, I, I've, you know, I, I did that with a documentary, and I certainly pitched fiction shows, but <clears throat> Lady Sherlock was the, the main thing that I did from scratch, though certainly the inspiration for that was Conan Doyle's universe. Well, no, no doubt, although you definitely go off in uh, directions that are not Conan Doyle. So that, you know, kudos to you for that. You're, you're, you weren't, you were riffing on that whole concept, but you weren't stealing from it, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, I tried. But uh, again, um, you know, a lot of our career, we had to come up with stories for, pre, for a pre-existing universe and characters. And yeah, so yeah. we had to find we had to find things in that universe and those characters that they hadn't explored yet. I, I like to call it um, uh, creating the sandbox. And once you've created yeah. that sandbox with the characters and the circumstances and the locations and the sets and all the rest of it, you can do anything you want within that sandbox. That's what a great television series is to me: is that someone has created this wonderful sandbox. And if you go outside that sandbox, you are going to be violating the rules of that particular world and people will go there's something wrong here it's it's what we now know as jumping the shark exactly and and if you're going to be a professional and a professional and have a career with longevity then then you have to you have to know you have to know that you have to look at that universe and know i can get right to the boundary but not beyond because on the boundary are a lot of great stories. Definitely. But beyond, 
you've jumped the shark. That's that's absolutely true. And I, you know, I, I think you've created a wonderful world in, in Lady Sherlock. And I and you know, again, my hats <laughs> off to you for for taking on a huge task like that to create a television. I mean, a, a novel like that is really a humongous challenge. So I might again my a tip of my hat to you for that. Um, let, let, let's talk about. Uh, being a professional writer for a moment, um, when you're working with producers, they have a demand on you. You're supposed to adhere to this world, as we just talked about. Your your job, your obligation is to adhere to that world that they've created. What is it that um, you wish that producers would do more of before hiring you for a job that would make your life simpler, smarter, more efficient, easier, and so on? One thing we always seem to run across, and not every show and not every time, but it's, it's a theme that runs through everyone's career, is that things get approved very late. And the pressure then goes back to the writer to do what they need to do in less time than they really need to do it. In, in other words, it, everybody's always uh, catching up, so to speak. Everyone's catching up, and part of that is because sometimes the people at the top are not making the decisions as quickly as they should. They get distracted, they're waiting to find more input from the people above them, and so it, it eventually filters down to the writer, and at that point the writer's kind of at the bottom of the chain, and the one they're hoping will save them. Uh, you... And then you hand it in and you get notes, and many times a good producer or story editor will sift through the notes, because the notes are going to come from various places, distill them, and give you the most important ones. The bad ones will just forward all of them, and you have to figure it out. And wonder what, where the politics lie, if you don't yeah. know. And wonder where the politics lie, and, who, yeah, who's the, important, who's, who's the important guy giving what note? <clears throat> and which ones can you kind of shine on, because, um, you know, some of the notes <coughs> will be contradictory, and some of them will be the ones, as I think I've heard you say, will be the, the one thread you pull on and the entire sweater unravel. That's exactly right. I do say that. Thank you. That's nice of you to remember. <laughs> uh, I, how many drafts do you typically do before you turn something in as a, let's call it a first draft, whatever your first draft is? How many drafts do you do before you turn it in? It varies, but a lot. I mean, and, and that's a really good point. Uh, especially not only for professional, but for people that are trying to break in. When you write something, you know, your first draft better be your 10th draft, your 6th, your 10th, because you get one chance to make an impression. And even a professional, if you hand in a bad draft, even if you're a professional, they may cut you off. Well, I know for me, it's, t it's typically somewhere between 8 and 15 drafts before it goes in as a, as a first draft. That sounds right. And, and, of course, you're revising as you go along. It, it's not that you sometimes have finished the whole thing and then, you know, go through it 15 times. Many times it'll be scene by scene. Oh, sure. And then you'll go over it two or three times when it's complete before you hand it in. But your first draft is only the first draft that you hand in. It's, it's never the first draft that you write. Well, I, I, ra rarely do you literally toss it all out and start over from scratch. Um, it's always revising. It's the dr one draft after yeah. another is, a, is hopefully an improvement. Sometimes it isn't, but uh, I, one draft after another is fixing things and making things, improving things in one way or shape or another. Is the same and thing... Sometimes also just trimming because your, your first draft may run long. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so you, you've got to condense, which is usually good. How many how many drafts of Lady Sherlock did you do before you were ready to show it to someone? Lady Sherlock actually started as a screenplay. Wow, well, that's interesting. It started, it started as a screenplay that I wrote, a, you know, several years ago, and it never sold, but got me a lot of work. And, um, you know, at, at the time, and, and as always, I'm hoping Wonder Woman does well because we need more female action heroes. And sure. I mean, someone once wanted to buy the script if I turn my hero and my turn Lady Sherlock into a guy. I know, face palm. Uh, do, you, <laughs> do you find that now that you've written a novel that there's now interest in it in other mediums? Uh, not yet, because my agent retired and I don't have an agent taking it around. But, but getting back to um, your, your story, so I, I looked at the script and said there's a novel here. Mm -hmm. And 
I said, this, you know, this will be easy. I'll just, you know, <laughs> change the format and add a few he said, she said, and, and all of that. <laughs> and they did that. And it was a novelized screenplay for about five drafts. <laughs> and, they, and they started working with another person who would have be a great interview, Sherry Goodhart, who said, she's a friend, again, relationship business, and said, I'll work with you editing it. And she's brilliant. It, and about 15 drafts later, mm-hmm. at least 15 drafts, at least, it was not a novelized screenplay. It was a novel, and very different, very different than the screenplay. It, the best laid plans of mice and men, you know, when you uh, say, "Oh, this will be easy," as soon as you that, say those words, "If this will be easy," you're you're doomed. Kiss of death. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't ever say this will be easy because it won't be. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be dead. No, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's there's dead. an there's an equivalent there. Having written, you you wrote Lady Sherlock as a feature, correct? Yes, as a feature, and but again, if if you were to go back and look at that script, very, very, very different. From sure, the but but my point is, is that in terms of the word easy, people have an, an assume things. Okay, you've written a script. Now all you have to do is go out and shoot it. Well, good luck. That's oh. way harder to do than anybody would imagine. Oh yeah, you know it's it's. Um... <laughs> it's it's, I, it's a bear. Actually, Produced and directed some low-budget films and, and things like that, and I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, you'll be cutting your own stuff on the set. So, so clearly, over a long period of time between writing the feature and writing the novel of Lady Sherlock, you put in a whole lot more hours and probably years compared to writing a television episode. I'm, I'm wondering, oh. in that long ordeal of putting it together. Um, did you have moments of doubt that you would ever finish? <laughs> is there sand in the Sahara? <laughs> well, okay, so what did you do? This is what I was driving at, is what did you do to get past the doubts aside from just pushing? Is there anything that you do to inspire yourself? Is there anything that you turn to? Is, is, it any, is there anyone you turn to? Uh Somehow in the back of my head, I knew I would finish Lady Sherlock. <clears throat> um, there were times when I, I had to get away from it. But, but I knew somehow there was a voice inside me that said, you'll, you'll get this done, and it's good. You know, it will be good. So it was but self-confidence. Other, other, yeah, in that. But, yeah, I mean, we all, I think, have our support system, friends, and, and an inner voice, and all of that that we, we work and go to to... To try to to try to get us through our spec work, and and I must say I haven't done a huge amount of spec work because when my career was really going strong, I was working all the time, and and so I wasn't doing a lot of spec stuff in my downtime. When you say you, well, let, let's be clear for the our listeners, uh, when you say you were working all the time, you were working as work for hire. People were hiring yeah. you to do work. You you weren't sitting at home pounding out. Uh, new spec work. You were uh, sitting there working for someone else, for some studio or producer. Yes, exactly. I, I, I was working on on TV assignments, and and, and, and and you've you've hit upon something you know important that I have written over a hundred episodes of animation and documentaries and some live action, and and I own none of it. Well, that is important. Copyright is a very big deal, and uh, it's quite different between the theater and uh, motion pictures and television, and it's something that's probably never going to change the way that it is now. Uh, But uh, uh, you can write uh, Lady Sherlock as a feature on spec, and who owns it? You do. Until what? You sell it, right? And then all the rights go to whoever buys it. But if you write it as a novel, then they have to buy the film rights, because the underlying rights remain with you. So that's a beautiful thing, then. Yes. You have the IP. You you do have the IP, or what is better known as the intellectual property. As, yes. Uh, IP, and, IP is a legal, a legal term of art. And, and so that, that is one huge difference. Uh, this is the only thing I've written that's out in the public that I own. And, and are you working right now? You don't have to get into any detail on it, but are you uh, working to exploit it somehow right now? Are you trying to find uh, out other outlets for it? I just started working on the sequel, but backtracking to your specific question, good God, 
the difference, but one big difference between screenwriting and novel writing is as a screenwriter, you get the assignment, you get paid, you get paid well, you hand it in, and then you don't have to think about it. It, it gets made, the studio, the network, whoever is the production entity, has a publicity department that gets it out there, and, and you're done. You know. But as a novelist, unless you're Stephen King or someone with a, a big guy with a big publisher, you have to do it all yourself. You are your own PR department. You are your own everything. Absolutely, I mean, no I question. Have, <clears throat> I have a publisher, and they did a great job physically producing the book, and that's where it pretty much stops. They, you know, they have lots of authors, and, and they depend on their authors to take it from there, and that is tough. Well, but is most tough. publishing houses, you know, I, I, as I understand it, they're trying to make um, a lot of money off of uh, little chips from a lot of work, and so they're not yeah. going to spend a lot of money or time or energy on your one work unless they can see a huge return on investment. And so uh, that leaves it up to the authors individually to go out and and create uh, publicity for yourself. So you have to learn an entirely new skill set that may not be natural to you as a writer. Now, I'm also a performer, so I'm a little more extroverted, but a lot of writers are very introverted. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up about your performance, because that was actually my next question. I, I'm, I'm so curious. Uh, you do something that I admire in a very big way. Um, you've been a magician for, I assume, most of your life. Um, and, you know, that's that's not just any kind of performer. That's a very, that's a very special place in the world, at least for me. I love magicians. I love magic. Um, does you, do you think that your work as a magician plays into your work as a writer or vice versa? I, I think any time you're doing something creative, there's a, there's a core of you that's engaged and involved because you're dealing with how to entertain. And as a writer, a good part of what we're figuring out is how to entertain. Well, sure. How, how does your performing, though, do, how does it inform your storytelling? A good magic trick is a story. It's got a beginning, middle, and end, a setup, engagement, and a payoff. And so when I, when I do a trick, I try to make it a narrative. I mostly do close-up, card work. So I try to make the card, the card trick a narrative, have a story with it, or at least structure the trick to where there's a beginning, middle, and end, and the act. So it builds to a beginning, middle, and end. And, and great magicians do this. You know, maybe they do it consciously, maybe it's instinctively, but the great ones certainly do it, especially, you know, uh, the, I say a big illusion will have a beginning, middle, and end. And I would also say in an odd way, don't you think that uh, writing a screenplay is a form of magic? It's a form of illusion, yes. You... Uh, because, I mean, we're using... We're using misdirection, illusion, things like that to tell our story. I get, and knowing, get, when to, knowing when to reveal something and when not to reveal something, hiding something until the big reveal. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So y y you just said something interesting. I, 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 for me, I know what the distinction is. I want to hear what you make a distinction between uh, a magic trick and an illusion. What, what, is, what are those differences? Well, a magic trick traditionally will be something done in, right in front of you. I mean, I mean, close in front of you. It's being done by the magician with something in his hands, cards, coins, uh, cups and balls. An illusion is a stage, usually a stage, um, a stage show uh, with a large, you know, a, a large box or something that an assistant goes into. So making a tiger appear and disappear, that kind of thing. That's an illusion. Um, changing a card from an ace to a three is a trick. It's it, and it's a really good trick if you're at a poker table. <laughs> yes, well, there was a as you know we we there was a poker game for a lot of writers that I was never allowed to join, no. and you tried to invite me, but the uh, people hosting it always said no. He's a magician. Everybody was afraid you were gonna you you know become a mechanic at the table. Well, just don't let me deal. <laughs> I, I, that's what I said. Just don't let him deal, and then he can play. <laughs> yeah, but it, it never seemed to work, and uh, maybe it's because the people hosting it, I did a poker trick for them one night at the Magic Castle, 
And the name of the trick was called You Lose, and no matter what cards they pick, they always lost. And perhaps that wasn't the smartest thing to do for people hosting a card game. <laughs> I, I, I think that may, you may have, you know, hit the nail right on the head there. So, okay, so uh, um, are there special places that you turn to in order to find new ideas? How do you refresh the well? You've told so many stories at this point in your life. You've pitched so many stories. Where do you go to refresh? I think we get inspiration from all kinds of places. For the sequel for Lady Sherlock, for instance, because the first novel was tied into something that was actually historic, you know, loosely, and then I, I extrapolated and kind of went to town on that, I wanted to find a real historic venue and see if that would lead me to a story. <clears throat> so I did research. You know, just trying to find something that would spark the imagination. Sure. You can also get that from watching the news, um, being inspired by other shows or movies you've seen. And I found, I found something in history that was within two years of the period of the first story and something that happened in that venue that I said, you know, this little incident here, I could springboard, I could extrapolate and exaggerate into maybe a plot, and, and I'm working on that. Well, I, I'm glad you said what you just said, because um, I think sometimes n newer writers think that it, it must m mainly come out of your own imagination. And in this case, uh, and in many cases, you had to do a little work. Oh, yes, and especially I'm dealing with a historic novel in a, a different time and a different country. That is a lot of research, not just for the big things, but for the little things. Well, you know, Bram Stoker never went to Transylvania to write before writing Dracula. He did it all by research in various um, libraries in, in, in England. Yeah, travel books and all kinds of things. And yes, it paid off for him. Certainly, I, I, certainly has a big idea. And of course, the first film version of Dracula was pirated and, and the victim of a lawsuit. Well, and, you know, now it's in the public domain, which is a, 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 a discussion for another day about public domain versus copyright. But, uh, but, but some, sometimes also, if, you know, if you're looking for a um, sale, I mean, yeah, and, and you're working on a series, I mean, one of the things I love is, you remember the original Star Trek, the, the original sure. series? of course. The, the episode that introduced the, Kling, the, uh, the Romulans, I think it was called The Balance of Terror, it's almost a scene-by-scene -scene remake of The Enemy Below, a film from about, you know, four or five years earlier wow. about an American destroyer hunting a U-boat. Uh, and I mean, scene for scene, sometimes dialogue, dialogue. How did they that get right? away with that? Well, because they changed it from a, a, a destroyer escort and U-boat to the Enterprise and a Romulan ship with an invisibility shield. But the cat and mouse game between the captains the relationship between the Romulan captain and his second-in-command, and even some of the dialogue and the respect they have for each other right from the enemy below. I mean, one of my favorite awful rip-off remakes was, remember the film Barbed Wire? Yes. Pa Pamela Anderson Lee? Yes, Barbed Wire. I mean, did you ever see that? Uh, I don't think I have. Well, you're lucky, but let me give you the setup and see <laughs> if it sounds familiar, okay? <laughs> sure. There's this neutral city that uh, is between two warring factions. Pamela Anderson Lee owns a nightclub, and she somehow got a hold of these contact lenses that will allow you to get past airport security and travel everywhere you want. She's very bitter because her former lover, uh, just as they were about to escape, uh, sent, him, sent her a letter saying, I can't be with you ever again, and leaves. That lover shows up in the city needing those contact lenses and with his wife, who he was married to, even when he knew Pamela Lee, but thought she'd been, uh, that the, the wife had been killed. Also in this town is a corrupt police chief. The bad guys arrive and want to keep her former lover, who's a big resistance leader, in the city. Is any of this sounding familiar? Uh, remind me. It's Casablanca, scene oh, by scene. Sure, of course. Yeah. And they and I, they did Casablanca, and I, you know, somebody had a sense of humor, but also a knowledge of classic film. Well, you know, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. That's a famous quote too. We're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Nobody's really creating anything totally new anymore. We're just um, uh, taking very old concepts and plot lines and 
uh, figuring out new ways to approach them uh, by using unique characters in conflict with other unique characters. But when someone rips something off, literally rips it off like that, that's, that's not a good thing. No, but even great director Costa Gavis did it. He did a film called uh, Mad City. Yes. With uh, John Travolta and Dustin Hoffman. Yes. I mean, this is a great director writer. This is a ripoff of Ace in the Hole. Oh, that's true. Um, so, you know, not that I'm telling people to rip things off, but I'm saying that you can get inspiration from watching old films, old TV shows, mm. and saying, is there something here that inspires me to go in a new direction? Who's your favorite writer, alive or dead? Oh, I don't think I have a favorite. I've got a lot. I love H.G. Wells and, and his use of language. I love George Orwell. Um as a kid, I read all the James Bond books. And clearly Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle is clearly Conan Doyle. I mean, um, <coughs> I, I like David Weber's um, Honor Harrington series, kind of outer space Horatio Hornblower. Mm -hmm. C.S. Forrester, I loved. So, um, those were some of the writers so that, these, that I loved. You, you've been inspired by many different sources. Yes, yes. Well, we've been chatting with... Um, the great writer Brooks Wachtel for the last, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. And um, this has just been a, a great joy and pleasure for me, Brooks, to have you on the show and to hear your perspective on the world of writing and storytelling and, and uh, how to be a professional in the business of, of all the above. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, do you have one really good solid piece of advice or a tip that you can lend our, le uh, our, our uh, listeners uh, to help them as they want to try and build their own careers? Maybe a couple of things. One we've already touched on, and that you only have one chance to make a first impression. So if you ever hand in anything, make it the very best it can be. Step away from it before you hand it in. Reread it a week later. Give it to friends who will be honest with you. Make it the very best thing you can, you can have it. And, of course, if you're pitching to a show, know that show and you know, make sure it looks like a script or whatever the format is. Also, um, have the height of a rhinoceros. You're going to get a lot of rejection. Don't let it get you down. Be persistent, because rejection is something professional writers live with daily, and, and you just can't let it get to you. Having a thick skin is an important part of being a pro. And the other thing is, if you want a career in television and movies, come to Los Angeles. You can't do it anywhere else. I, I can tell you that for a fact certain. Um, <laughs> you, have, you have to be here because it is also a relationship business. And in television, and, and my friend Stephen Sears would be a great interview, pointed this out. In features, the script is what they're buying and what they're working with. In television, it's you. Because, granted, you have to be a good writer, but they're also looking for people that they can work with, that they like. Not like in the sense that, hey, we're going to go out and drink beers together, but that they can work with on a long-term basis. Oh, they could, somebody that they can spend uh, anywhere from 10 to 16 hours a day in a room six days a week sometimes. Yeah, and, and, and that is given that you're a good writer. Yes. And then also take deadlines seriously. If you get that first job and they say we need a 36-page 36 36 page count and we need it Thursday, you give them 36 great pages Thursday. I think that's a very wise thing to tell everyone because some people don't believe it until they're confronted by it. Um, deadlines are serious because when that script gets handed in, a hundred other people are waiting for that document. And they can't do their jobs until they get it. Well, and, the less, and if you're late, they're rushed. You're pushing their backs against the wall. That is for sure. Well, Brooks, this has been a a great treat for me and I'm so delighted that you were able to spend a little time on Storybeat today and I want to thank you very much for coming on with us. Thank you very much for having me as your guest. Um, you know, we've, we've known each other a long time. I've always been a big fan of your work and an admirer of you personally. Well, so thank you very much for having me as your guest. Well, thank you, Brooks, and, and have a great day and thanks for being with us. Take care. My thanks again to the great Brooks Wachtel for spending a little time with us on Storybeat today. Today's Storybeat tip, the adage, get in late and get out early, is often attributed to the noted playwright, screenwriter, and director David Mamet.
but its genesis may well predate his having said it. It's really a restating of Aristotle's notion that the story should neither start before its beginning nor go on after its ending. We likely don't need to know when our hero was born, what schools he or she attended, or who his or her first love was. We usually want to start a story in the middle of a character's life, not when he or she's a baby. This is called in medias res. So start as deep as possible in your story and drop in bits and pieces of the backstory along the way. If you want to see maybe the best example ever of this, watch Orson Welles' classic, Citizen Kane. For similar reasons, only give the audience enough information to begin and end a scene, a line, or the whole story. No need to give them more. Keep this in mind when writing your story, get in late, and get out early. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. This podcast would not have been possible without the tremendous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.